This is the first of three lectures on the Franco-Czech writer Milan Kundera. Uh, the first lecture will focus on Milan Kundera's The Art of the Novel and his views about the novel and what a novel is, which we will examine before we look uh, particularly at the case of uh, unbearable lightness of being. And there'll be two lectures on unbearable lightness of being, which will follow this lecture. Uh, the first lecture will focus on more more on questions of genre or how uh, what 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 uh, Kundera is doing with his uh, with with the form of his novel, say in opposition to uh, Soviet socialist realism. Uh, he was a, a writer who uh, you know grew up lived his fir the first years of his life his young adulthood in uh, what was at that time Czechoslovakia in Prague. And uh, before he became a, uh, an immigrant to, uh, to France and lived the rest of his uh, adult life in France, he's still in France today. And, uh, and he, he has written, published in both the, the Czech language and the French language as well. Um, so we're going to see, as, as we'll investigate, uh, Kundera has many uh, books that he's written, and uh, these are just a few of them. We cannot uh, obviously look at all of them. We're only going to be looking at the unbearable lightness of being, uh, and then some excerpts from the art of the novel and testaments betrayed. Uh, and even then, as we look at the unbearable lightness of being, we're only going to follow through a couple of themes. This is a novel that is very rich in themes. It would take uh, probably at least a half dozen lectures to uh, pursue all of the themes that uh, that that this novel uh, includes. Uh, so we're only going to look at one uh, that is relevant to the series of lectures that we're doing on animal metamorphosis. So we're going to investigate the theme of animal metamorphosis and the unbearable lightness of being, uh, but only after we've taken a little time uh, to think about you know what the novel is for Kundera. And how Kundera, what you know, one of some of the defining features of what you know make Kundera the writer that he is, and some of the contributions that he's made to the rethinking of the novel itself in broad uh, generic terms. And I mean this, uh, for instance, in relation to the claims of many that the novel itself is a kind of a played out genre. Uh, the modern novel, uh, in particularly, and 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 we're going to investigate how Kundera is a kind of a neo-modernist, or how he he reinvigorates the modern novel by uh, by by introducing a number of, of really interesting generic transformations, uh, uh, some of which that come from his uh, experience growing up and how his father was a musician, uh, learning uh, musical composition, and many of his views about the composition of the novel. Uh, are um, mirrored in his views about uh, musical composition itself. Now he did not himself write much musical composition, but he was he was trained in music, and uh, and, and it, that clearly shows in uh, his uh, sort of I'll say sort of non theoretical theory of the novel uh, that he presents in the art of the novel and testaments betrayed. Now I really want to emphasize this point because uh, Kundera. You know, makes very clear that he's not a uh, a philosopher. He's not a theorist. That his his statements about the novel and the art of the novel are you know the conjectural statements of, of a working novelist. They're not intended to provide us with a coherent dogma or doctrine of, of the novel. He's very insistent on this point. We'll we'll come back to this as we look at both his theory of. Uh, of, of, or what what goes into I should say the the writing of the novel for him, and uh, and and as we look at uh, his own novel, uh, the unbearable lightness of being, and see how some of these ideas carry through toward in the composition of that novel. Um, now, um, as you can see here, he was born in 1929. He's still alive uh, today. Uh, he published uh, very recently, as you can see there, a book, The Festival of Insignificance in 2014. It regrettably did not receive, uh, uh, in my view, the critical claim, a claim that it deserved. It's a wonderful novel. It's a very short novel. It's probably more of a novella, uh, but it's, it's an extraordinarily 
complex uh, and, and interesting work. So I, uh, I do uh, recommend it. Uh, it's it's a fascinating read, but many many of his uh, were you know like the the book that brought him into perhaps the most prominence was the book in 1967, The Joke, um, which uh, as, as is very clear um, when you when you look at this novel, uh, the influence of Kafka is quite uh, uh, obvious. Now Kafka was a no, uh, was a, a novelist from Prague, like Kundera, so it shouldn't surprise us that Kundera would see. And Kafka as a kind of as an important influence and literary precursor for him. But he's writing; he was writing at this time as as a dissident within a uh, a state that had been as effectively uh, conquered or colonized by the Soviet Union. Um, and um, well, this happened especially in the in the uh, in, in May '68 in the, what's called the Prague Spring. But but uh, but the joke is is a uh, a novel about uh, a, a young man who makes a joke on a postcard about Stalin and ends up getting sent to a work camp, and and so the joke turns out to be not quite so funny. Uh, the the, the Kafka uh, dimensions of this text are uh, obvious. Uh, it's but it, it's not uh, it, it's a very rich novel in its own right. It's by no means derivative. It's 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 a rich, fascinating, interesting novel that I do uh, recommend. Um, perhaps the besides the unbearable lightness of of uh, being the book of laughter and forgetting is uh, is is let's say in terms of composition and uh, aesthetic integrity is perhaps his most uh, important uh, work. It's 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 an amazingly complex novel uh which which raises all kinds of provocative uh, themes okay so uh, but but i want to here look at uh kundera as as novelist and to think about kundera as as a novelist and and let me just say here at the beginning that you know one of the kundera's uh points of emphasis is that uh, he, he likes to emphasize this idea that you know of, of anonymity that you know uh, that, that writers who want to write uh, you know should should in effect uh, if, if if one is a novelist in any case uh, one should in effect disappear uh, and 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 not be a, a public uh, persona and so Kundera has uh, pursued this idea and he's quite serious about it and he, so he's very reticent in terms of giving interviews I think he had a few bad experiences giving early interviews so he 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 demands sort of right of editorial correction of any interview uh and, and but he's very uh cautious about giving interviews because he knows how um how uh, easily uh, the words that he says can be uh distorted uh he also is a champion of this of, of uh, let's say the the liberal uh, division of the public and private he's a very private individual uh, and so in honoring that, we're not going to talk a whole lot about his private life. We're just going to go right into the question of, um, you know, of what a novelist uh, is for him. Uh, again, he's throwing these ideas out and in, in not uh, presenting any sort of theory. But from uh, Art of the Novel, he says, quoting Flaubert, the novelist is one who seeks to disappear behind his work, to disappear uh, behind his work, that is to renounce the role of public figure, all right? And so like Flaubert, Kundera has no interest in appearing in the role of a, a public figure, and he believes that that is the proper, uh, you know, uh, posture of the novelist. Um, here's another quote from Art of the Novel. The artist must make posterity believe he never lived, Flaubert asked. Someone asked Car uh, Carol Capek why he doesn't write poetry. His answer, because I loathe talking about myself the distinctive feature of the true novelist. He does not like to talk about himself. And uh, this has certainly been the case for Kundera throughout his career, his long and very productive career. Uh, he rarely uh, talks about himself, however. Um, okay, he, here's where he says in the art of the novel, I dream of a world where writers will be required by law to keep their identity secret and to use uh, pseudonyms. Three advantages, a, dra a drastic reduction of graphomania, and you can see here below the definition of graphomania that he gives us is that this is the mania not to create a form, but to impose oneself on others. The most grotesque version 
of the will to power, he says, okay? So uh, reduction of graphomania, decreased aggressiveness in literary life, the disappearance of biographical interpretations of works. All right, so now with, in the case of Kundera, again, he's going to say often that, you know, one should be, one should attend to the tone of his uh, apparent, uh, his ostensible philosophical utterances and, and, and always uh, be attuned to the irony uh, within them. And so we can't really know, I think, if he's, if he, he's probably not serious when he says required by law uh, to keep their identity secret. Uh, but uh, you know, but but certainly, uh, his 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 point is well made, and it's very you know to pr uh, provocative to think about, uh, you know what uh, a world uh, what, what what a world of writing would look like in which the proper name has no significance. Uh, this is akin to the Foucault's question: you know, What does it matter who's speaking? Uh, and certainly, it would it might you know change a great deal of what of, of the literature that is produced if none of the credit is going to accrue back to the name of the person who produced uh, the work, okay? Um, but here, here again, here's uh, Kundera's uh, uh, assertion. He's gonna say, I am not a philosopher, but a novelist. Indeed, for me, the founder of the modern era is not only Descartes, but Cervantes. Don, uh, uh, Cervantes, who wrote, of course, wrote Don Quixote. Uh, so this is this is a posture that he's going to insist upon, and he's he's going to make this point, you know, repeat. It. He's going to say there's a fundamental difference between the ways that philosophers and novelists think. People talk about Chekhov's philosophy or Kafka's or Musil's and so on, but just try to draw a coherent philosophy out of their writings, even when they express their ideas directly in their notebooks. The ideas are intellectual exercises, paradox games improvisations rather than statements of thought. And I, th I think we should really keep that in mind as we as we look at, say, the unbearable lightness of being or any of the other works by Kundera, that that although it's clear he's very steeped in philosophy, he, he's read uh, deeply in, let's say, Heidegger, for instance, who I think is, is obviously an, uh, an influence. I mean, think, for instance, the Book of Laughter and Forgetting. I mean, forgetting is, is a sort of quintessentially Heideggerian theme, as is the theme of, of being. Uh, and yet uh, there, there's an important difference. And that is, that, as he says here, you know, his ideas are intellectual er uh, exercises, paradox games, improvisations, rather than statements of thought, particularly that can be systematized. And so he's, he's very resistant to the system, uh, to, well, let's say to the turning of his ideas into dogma. And so we always need to kind of as, you know, his, his ideas are very provocative in his novels, but they, but they occur within the space of, uh, you know, with, let's say within a novelistic space so that philosophy comes to be subsumed within the novel rather than uh, the other way around. And I like it. I like, I, I like the way that he even rebukes Heidegger at one point where he says uh, something to the effect of that, you know, Heidegger was wrong to uh, dismiss novels as just you know uh, insignificant scribblings, because the not because novels have a, a great potential to investigate the you know questions of being you know phenomenological questions as well, and so um, you know he 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 Kundera is although he's he he playfully articulates these. Uh, uh, notions. Uh, the the play is is very you know sort of serious play uh, at, at the same time. Okay, uh, but he says here again are the, the the novelist makes no great issue of his ideas. He is an explorer feeling his way in an effort to reveal some unknown aspect of existence. He is fascinated not by his voice but by a form he is seeking. Okay, and then in Testaments Betrayed. Which was written a little bit later. A really interesting book of essays that is very provocative on a diverse variety of topics. He says even uh, more vehemently. He says, "I have always deeply, violently detested those who look for a position, political, philosophical, religious, whatever, in a work of art, rather than searching uh, it for an effort to know, to understand, to grasp this." or that aspect of reality, okay? Or you should be searching in it for an effort to know, to understand, to grasp this or that aspect of reality. Okay, so I wanna 
pause on this for just uh, a minute and underscore here uh, a, an important way of thinking about Kundera's novels. Now, we, we want to put the, the, his thinking of the novel and his novels themselves arise within a particular context, and that context is the context of uh, of the world that is that is the, uh, the, the during the Cold War uh, of the so-called you know Second World. Now, now uh, Kundera emphasizes you know repeatedly that that Russian culture and Czech culture are are very different things, and yet when the Russians you know turn uh, let's say converted what is today Czech, what was then Czechoslovakia into a, uh, a, a essentially a satellite state, you know, for them. Uh, and, and, and this culminated, you know, again, in the, in the invasion of 1968, where Soviet tanks came, you know, uh, into Prague. And, and Kundera, you know, writes about this in The Unbearable Lightness of Being and elsewhere, um, that, uh, that, that uh, th this, was, this was one culture one alien culture uh, invading another. The Czech language uh, has is very different from the Russian language. Czech culture is very different from Russian culture, and you know Kundera, you know, uh, uh, often will describe you know Prague as being sort of part of that Central European you know culture that's linked to places you know like Vienna it has a very long and ancient history, and so the Russians, uh, you know, during the Cold War, essentially colonized. Uh, Central Europe, and so he he uh, you know uh, often you know describes the situation as being one akin to a kind of a uh, uh, an an imperial situation. In that sense, we might even think of Kundera's novels as a kind of a you know a post-colonial literature, literature responding to a kind of a colonization, which a a, a dogmatic uh, you know socialist Marxist ideology was. Uh, you know, was installed and mandated by the state. So he's writing as someone from within that context who uh, comes to be uh, a dissident within that state. Now, uh, one of the things that we'll explore is that the uh, that, that during the era of, of the Soviet Union, that an aesthetic theory developed in the Soviet Union that, you know, is linked to Marx and Engels, but also figures like Yerge Lukash, that became a kind of a, a mandating uh, of, uh, of political realism. So that political realism, which became a kind of a Soviet socialist, uh, known as Soviet socialist realism, was essentially not mandatory for uh, writers of fiction. And so I, I think this is worth, we'll look at what these, what the constituent elements of this uh, genre were. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this now because we're gonna see when we look at unbearable lightness of being, uh, in, in the next lecture, how there's a sense in which the very genre of, of Kundera's novels is, is uh, you know, a, a uh, uh, I don't say it's a reaction against, but it's certainly a negation of um, this, this uh, Soviet socialist realism, which was mandated, you know, by the party, by the state, and which writers only, uh, you know, uh, uh, ignored and didn't, uh, you know, sort of follow this cookie cutter, you know, pattern of what a novel should be at their own risk. Okay, so so his Kundera's novels, in my view, are revolutionary in terms of their form, not only in terms of their, uh, you know, the, the, the criticisms that they entail of uh, the Soviet Union and of, of communism itself. And of course, it was the, it was the, it was the uh, Hungarian Marxist, Jürgen Lukács, who himself said that the most revolutionary element in uh, uh, a, uh, or let's say the most political element of a literary genre is 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 its form, and so uh, Kundera's novels are um, are profoundly, let's say, anti-socialist realism, which is which which by implication is anti, um, you know, Soviet communism in, in their very in their very generic makeup. Okay, um, and and part of this, as we're going to see, involves uh, as, as clear from this statement is this notion uh, that literature, the novel, for instance, and especially should should involve the assertion of a kind of a position. And so we're going to see you know, that, that the Kundera's uh, vision of the novel is it's a profoundly anti-thetic, anti-thesis. Novels should not have, let's say, Cartesian theses. Uh, they should not promote, you know, particular political positions. They should not, and others, and another way to say this is be conversionary. The goal of the novel is not to convert your reader to a political, to any particular 
uh, political view. Now, as we're going to see, the, the, the term that he uses for a novel that is, let's say, evangelical or conversionary, you know, whether we're talking about a, a Marxist ideology or a Christian ideology or, let's say, a feminist ideology, you know, whatever, whatever ideology we're talking about, uh, the novel itself should not, for Kundera, promote any kind of conversionary uh, position. That's not what novels are for, and it's not what they do. And 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 the not and so we can think of the lyrical novel. What this term that he's going to use, the lyrical novel, is what is the term that he's going to use for the conversionary, evangelical, uh, Cartesian thesis-driven novel. Uh, as opposed to, uh, and he doesn't use this term, but what I'm calling here anti-lyrical novel, the novel that, that does not, that, that seeks to ask a question rather than assert a thesis. Okay, so, and this is, this is also the sense in which Kundera, his novels are uh, Heideggerian in some sense, because this is a very Heideggerian notion as well. It's this Heideggerian theme of the question of the questions. For, for Kundera, novels are, about asking, you know, questions rather than asserting theses, and he has this in common with uh, with uh, uh, Martin Heidegger. Okay, um, so here, just to give you to this, this will I think encapsulate what the basic ideas or the ideology that, that underwrote, you know, socialist or Soviet realism. There was this interesting debate that took place in spring of 1859. Uh, it's called the Sikaking debate. And uh, the Sika King was a uh, was a uh, was a medieval figure who um, you know was was a kind of an aristocrat who was present during a time of a peasant uprising. And there was there was a playwright named Ferdinand de Salle, uh, excuse me, Ferdinand de Salle, who who wrote a uh, uh, a play about this figure, who uh, was was uh, was one of the participants or players during the time of this. Uh, this this peasant uh, uprising against the uh, you know the the, arist uh, the aristocracy, um, and uh, so it was a play about revolution in effect, um, and this is, has come to be known as the first Marxist literary debate. And so what LaSalle did is he sent this play that he wrote uh, to Karl Marx and to Frederick Engels. Now they were living in different places and they did not correspond with one another about this, but they responded in very similar terms to uh, LaSalle and this is this was what they said to him but um, but I, I note here that their that their views were kind of were since essentially conjectural uh, when they gave his critique of when they gave their critique of his play of LaSalle's play but their but their uh, conjectural statements uh, in time became party dogma uh, and so they essentially they they what they agreed what Marx and Engels uh, suggested was that 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 you know literature that is uh, let's say uh, uh, progressive or sufficiently progressive should have should have embody three features it should be a matter of realism uh, typology and characters now by realism that this means that 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 you know Marxist literature should be reflectionist it should mirror uh, reality so in this sense like like Tolstoy, was was uh, would be a figure that they uh, would they, that they venerated in this regard, and uh, although of course you know Lenin for instance later was very critical of Tolstoy's you know Christian uh, socialism. He said there was too, sort of too much in the late Tolstoy. There was I think uh, Lenin said something to the effect that he was too much of a kind of a holy fool in his later life. But they're but they're thinking about uh, the the Tolstoy of Anna Karenina and the War and Peace. And so Tolstoy becomes this this figure of you know one should write like Tolstoy, uh, you know it's later Bertolt Brecht's going to call this the uh, spicing up of uh, uh, rotten meat you know by writing like Tolstoy only up to date and this was you know realism in this sense this embracing of of this mirror reflectionist aesthetics implied a profound uh, rejection of modernism indeed many of the writers like once the Soviet Union came into being. Uh, particularly during the the period of uh, Stalin, um, many of the the writers associated with modernism, like you know Ezra Pound, T. S. Eliot, uh, Kafka, uh, Proust, and others, were, uh, were were rejected. And this became known as sort of the formalist heresy that that modernist writers were accused of committing. And so um, you know, so so there was a there was a, an insistence upon realism itself, like nineteenth century realism. 
Now, the second feature that of this theory of, of literature, this ideology of what a novel should should uh, be or, or should what it should entail is, is this notion of typology. Now, typology is a kind of a Hegelian term. And so the idea is that it should be typical characters in typical circumstances. And, and this implied a rejection, let's say, of, of, of you know, like, like let's, if you take the example of Dostoevsky's uh, a crime and punishment about a young man who commits a murder as a kind of a philosophical uh, experiment. You know, this you know th this would be a kind of a, mar a marginalia or dealing with themes dealing with madness and dreams and and and, and people living on the margins of society. Uh, you know that 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 no the novelist the novelist should focus on what is really you know typical in in his or her society because this also links the novel itself to the mode of production in in uh, marxist uh, ideology uh, and then characters they one of the things that they criticized about lasalle's play both marx and engels is that he made sikaking who was a uh, himself a kind of an, a petty aristocrat the center of of the debate or excuse me the center of of the play that um that he wrote and, and Marx and Engels both felt that the that the char that the main characters of the work of the novel should be chosen from the uh, from the oppressed class or from you know from from the working class the the the, the, char the vanguard who who were leading uh, revolutionary struggle rather than like in this case somebody who was kind of a minor aristocrat looking on at the action as it's as it's taking place um, so uh, the, these were these were three features that became kind of definitive. Of, of what became known as Soviet or socialist realism. Now, here's Engels. He's going to state realism to my mind, and, and note this sort of subjective conjectural to my mind uh, implies, tr besides truth of def uh, detail, the truthful reproduction of typical characters in typical circumstances. And so we could say with Soviet or socialist realism, particularly under Stalin's Danoff and later you know, Yergei Lukash, the, the more cautious subjective awareness of Marx and Engels, this to my mind drops out and, and, and what they, they posit, uh, this, these, these three features that they posit become in effect party dogma. And so it's this kind of uh, ossification of the novel as a genre itself that, that Kundera is also rejecting, not just his themes, in other words, don't just reject a party dogma, the very form of his literary works imply a rebuke to this kind of uh, doctrine. Okay. Um, okay, so here's here is Kundera himself. Here's a comment that he makes on uh, socialist Soviet realism. He's speaking in this context, of, he's defining this word, uh, mis the misomusist, who is a person who hates, uh, uh, who, who has, a, let's say, a hatred for the arts. He's going to say, uh, to be without a feeling for art is no disaster. A person can live in peace without reading Proust or listening to Schubert. Uh, but the misomusist, the misomusist does not live in peace. He feels humiliated by the existence of something that is beyond him, and he hates it. There is a popular misomusy just as there is a popular anti-Semitism. The fascist and communist regimes made use of it, when they declared war on modern art. But there is an intellectual misomusy as well. It takes revenge on art by forcing it to a purpose beyond the aesthetic. The doctrine of en engage art, art as an instrument of politics. Okay, well, there, there's a very stern rebuke of the doctrine of Soviet or socialist realism, which also, again, uh, emphasizes this notion that you know novels should not have theses; they should not be subordinated to politics. A novel that is subordinated to politics to serve as an instrument of politics ceases to be a novel and and becomes, in effect, a kind of a political pamphlet or an attempt to uh, proselytize or convert. So this is this is a a, a reassertion of the Kantian doctrine of, you know, art for art's sake or l'art pour l'art. Um, and, but, but what Kundera is doing in the context of the, the, the Soviet being, you know, being a, a person who lived in a former Soviet, you know, satellite state is he is, um, he's, he's reinvigorating uh, 
this Kantian doctrine, and it becomes uh, it becomes uh, a quite uh, the, the conflict becomes quite acute. Um, now the conflict was always there. Uh, the Soviet theorists uh, rejected very uh, very clearly, uh, as did you know many Marxist theorists. Not all of them, for instance, certainly not the Frankfurt School uh, theorists. Um, they rejected this aspect of Soviet uh, Marxism as well. Um, but uh, uh, he he's he's uh, you know he 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 takes it to another level I think and he uh, he, uh, he 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 re, he reinvigorates the uh, Lark pro Lark in in a political context that is very different from the context that that prevailed say during the 19th century okay okay so here here he is, here's Kundera in Art of the Novel from 1857. The year that Madame Bovary, Flaubert's Madame Bovary, is published, on the hist uh, 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 excuse me, from 1857 on, the history of the novel will be that of the novel become poetry. Okay, so this is this is a, a key uh, point. Let me just pause here for just uh, a minute. Uh, the novel become poetry. Hemingway says something very similar. He says that that novels should be uh, you know uh, poetry in the prose, and so. What, what, what he's applauding about Flaubert, and, and Hemingway does as well, he calls Flaubert our most you know, venerated master at one point, Hemingway says, is, um, is, is, is the novelist uh, after Flaubert begins to write the novel with the integrity of, of a poem. It, it takes on a kind of a poetic you know, density uh, within it. And so this is what uh, Flaubert is uh, being uh, uh, praised for here. As, as sort of inaugurating this tradition. Now, Kundera follows in this tradition, and this is one of the reasons why his novels are often very short, because even though they're novels, they're novels that have the integrity of, of let's say, a prose poem, like, say, Rimbaud, for instance. They're, 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 they're very dense. There's a lot of uh, information that is, is included, uh, much like, you know, in the reading of a poem, you have to really unpack a poem to to get at all of its meaning, which is why I'm only going to be following you know a couple of themes from the unbearable lightness of being because there's so much in that novel that to uh, it, it would require, as I said, a series of lectures to investigate, follow up uh, the the many themes that it it includes. Okay, so um, he's going to say, uh, but to take on the requirements of poetry is quite another thing from lyricizing the novel, okay? So again, remember the lyrical novel is a stigmatized term for him. It's linked to the idea of the novel that's a, that asserts a thesis, that is conversionary, that has a political a telos or goal. Uh, for uh, foregoing its essential irony, turning away from the outside world, transforming the novel into personal confession, weighing it down with ornament. The greatest of the novelists become poets, are violently anti-lyrical. Flaubert, Joyce, Kafka, uh, Grombowitz. Uh, the novel is, again, his concise definition of it, anti-lyrical poetry, okay? Anti-lyrical poetry. There he uses uh, very specifically this idea of anti-lyrical, as I'm calling his novel in the next lecture, the anti-lyrical novel. The lyrical is the expression of a self revealing subjectivity, he will also say in the art of the novel. And this is something he is he's very critical of, this expression of self-revealing uh, subjectivity. Okay, um, he says, because of my, what he calls an interesting phrase here, furious non-identification, conceived not as evasion or passivity, but as resistance, defiance, rebellion, I wound up having some odd conversations. Are you a communist, Mr. Kundera? No. I'm a novelist. Are you a dissident? No. I'm a novelist. Are you on the left or the right? Neither. I'm a novelist. Now, this this may seem odd, particularly when from say the context of being, you know, uh, in the in, in the United States and uh, at this juncture in history, as opposed to the context within which Kundera's novels uh, arose. Um, however, one can see how, uh, in a world that has become so over politicized, that there is a kind of a rebellious defiance in insisting upon the priority of, of simply being a novelist rather than, than being forced to uh, affirm one political position or, or another. And I think in the United States today, we're beginning to, uh, I think we're in a position to increasingly grasp the wisdom of this as we see ourselves living in a world that is so 
increasingly politicized where everything that you do, like right now I'm giving these lectures in the context of, of the coronavirus and we see how, uh, you know, even, even something like the coronavirus can be, become uh, politicized. Uh, and, and that's what we're seeing happening right now. Um, and, with, with, and with the fatigue of the kind of politicization that we see, uh, you know, all around us, that, that this the position perhaps could look uh, attractive to some of us. Um, okay, here's Kundera on, on Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote, who is for him the founder of the modern period, along with, say, Descartes. He's going to say, and again, but we got to remember again that he's speaking this, when he speaks philosophically, he's, uh, he, that, that, that we got to attend to the tone and the irony here, because he's not speaking as a philosopher, but as a novelist who reads philosophy. The two great philosophers, Herschel and Heidegger, laid bare the ambiguity of this epic, the modern epic that we live in, which is decline and progress at the same time, and which, uh, like all that is human, carries the seed of its end uh, in its beginning. To my mind, this ambiguity does not diminish that, uh, that last four centuries of European culture, to which I feel all the more attached, as I am not a philosopher but a novelist. Okay, now note here too that that as a novelist, that Kundera also has a very strong identification as as a European, right? Uh, that that he he was from Central Europe. He's lived uh, his most of the rest of his adult life since leaving Prague in France, and now he's a French citizen. But he sees himself above all as, as a European, and he sees the novel as as a European form. And, and as and as one of the legacies that uh, Europe, you know, has brings to the world, cultural legacies is this wonderful creation, this wonderful genre, you know, of the novel to which he affiliates himself. He says, indeed, for me, the founder of the modern era is not only Descartes, but also uh, Cervantes. Okay, now in the context of the uh, of this uh, series of, of novels that we're reading on animal metamorphosis. In, uh, in, in this uh, series of lectures on animal metamorphosis, um, you know, we can, uh, we, we can see that, uh, you know, that there are novels that are, like if we take the case of Apuleius's The Golden Ass, well, arguably it's, it's, it's an African uh, genre as well, as I said in a previous lecture when we talked about uh, The Golden Ass. Um, but it was, you know, he was also, but, but those kinds of distinctions are meaningless in the time that uh, Apuleius was writing. Uh, at the time when, you know, North Africa and, and the Mediterranean coast and Europe were essentially all part of one uh, civilization, one culture. And so we, I, I think I'm just I'm stopping here and noting this for a moment because we can see how, you know, the novel, um, you know, it has it has this history of being, you know, linked to not just uh, Europe and, you know, the, in the uh, era of um of, of the uh, you know mercantile capitalism, uh, but also it has it, it goes back even you know longer to this you know back to the very early uh, days of the founding of you know European civilization. We think of Apuleius as novel as you know, almost two thousand years old, but uh, but 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 the novel uh, as it's typically thought of in Europe you know comes out of the sort of thinking of the novel of, being, of Cervantes figures like Cervantes and Rabelais, who's another uh, author novelist that. Kundera really holds in very high esteem. We're really linked more, let's say, to the end of the feudal period and, and the emergence of the era of, of, of market or mercantile uh, capitalism. And we can think of, you know, Don Quixote as being a knight, sort of one foot in, in the medieval period, the feudal period, and one foot in the, um, you know, in, in this new world that's mechanized, this new reality in which the knight has become a kind of an anachronism. And so Don Quixote doesn't, you know, go out and fight other knights or dragons. He fights, you know, machines. He fights, you know, a windmill. So this, this, uh, th this idea, what Hegel's going to call the novel, a, uh, the, the bourgeois epic or the epic of the middle class, this idea that, you know, the novelist uh, emerges uh, at this period of, you know, uh, in this new era of, of capitalism and, and is very uncertain about this reality. That, that he uh, or she uh, confronts. And so Cervantes, is, uh, Don Quixote, has become a kind of a figure of, of, the, of the early novel. So he's meaning it in this way. I don't think he's thinking here about like a novel like Apuleius. And yet, as we're going to see when we look at the unbearable lightness of being, that it too is it like uh, it, it is the inverse of, um, 
uh, of, uh, of, of the story of, of the golden ass. Uh, and, and, and really, you know, clearly uh, Kundera has read, I mean, I, I, I'll give you another instance is if we take the, the uh, Book of Laughter and Forgetting, uh, Kundera there investigates the theme of, um, you know, uh, themes that were present in Daphnis and Chloe, which was a novel written even before, um, you know, Apuleius's novel. So um, whether or not he's including these two novels in his definition of the novel being linked to the modern era, I, I'm not really sure, but I, I do think it's important to underscore here that he uh, really celebrates Cervantes as this figure who has, who has every bit as much importance as uh, Descartes, but perhaps is neglected. Uh, he says, perhaps it is uh, Cervantes whom the two phenomenologists, Herschel and Heidegger, neglected to take into consideration uh, in their judgment of the modern era. That's certainly true. Uh, by that, I mean, it is true that philosophy and science have forgotten about man's being. Uh, if it is true, uh, it emerges all the more plainly that with Cervantes, a great European art took shape that is nothing other than the investigation of this forgotten being. Indeed, all the great existential themes Heidegger analyzes in being in time, considering them to have been neglected by all earlier European philosophy, had been unveiled, displayed, illuminated by four centuries of the novel, four centuries of European reincarnation of the novel. In its own way, through its own logic, the novel discovered the various dimensions of existence one by one. Uh, with Cervantes and his contemporaries, it inquires into the nature of adventure. With Richardson, it begins to examine, you know, quote unquote, what happens inside, to uh, unmask the secret of the feelings. With Balzac, it discovers man's rootedness in history. With Flaubert, it, it explores the terra previously incognita of the everyday. With Tolstoy, it focuses on the intrusion of the irrational in human behavior and decisions. It probes time, the elusive past with Proust, the elusive present with Joyce. With Thomas Mann, it examines the role of the myths from the remote past that control our present actions, et cetera, et cetera. The novel has accompanied man uninterruptedly and faithfully since the beginning of the modern era. It was then that, that the passion to know, which Herschel considered the essence of European spirituality, seized the novel and led it to scrutinize man's concrete life and protect it against the forgetting of being, again, this Heideggerian theme, to hold the world of life under a permanent light. That is the sense in which I understand and share Hermann Brock's insistence in repeating, the sole raison d'etre, the sole reason of being that, that a novel exists, is to discover what only the novel can discover. A novel that does not discover a hitherto unknown segment of existence is immoral. Knowledge is the novel's only morality. Okay, that's, that's a pretty important point there that we have at the end, that a novel that does not discover a hitherto unknown segment of existence is immoral. Knowledge is the novel's only morality. Okay. So uh, that's, if, if, you, if, you, if you got that, then you're going to understand quite a lot about what uh, Kundera is doing. Is it an, it's an investigation of being, as we said previously within Heidegger, the Heideggerian theme of the question of the question that one asks a question of being. The novel, similarly for uh, Kundera, you know, asks a question about being, investigates a segment or an unknown segment of being or, or existence. And, and a novel that doesn't do that is immoral. Let's say if a novel is just promoting some uh, dogmatic, uh, you know, thesis or, or, or political party's views. Um, and so knowledge is the novel's only morality. Now, now Kundera, some have criticized Kundera's, uh, the themes of Kundera's novels because they deal with, say, with issues of, of the libertine uh, uh, questions of sexuality that some regard as, as immoral. Uh, and I think uh, Kundera deliberately does this to to be, uh, you know, provocative to to uh, to to uh, 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 let's say to to underscore this point that that a novel is is there not to promote any particular moral view, but to simply uh, shed light on a on a new aspect of human existence that we didn't know previous to the novel's uh, publication. Uh, 
For a novelist, a given historical situation is an anthropologic laboratory in which he explores his basic question, what is human existence? The novel, of course, does not answer this question or these questions. The question is already an answer in itself. For as Heidegger put it, the essence of man has the form of a question. Okay, so that's a straight up a Heideggerian uh, proposition. Uh, if, if in, for instance, in the opening pages of, uh, of the introduction to metaphysics, Heidegger asks the question he calls first in rank, why are there beings rather than nothing at all? He poses the question of the question. He poses it in being in time. He poses it in the fundamental concepts of metaphysics, as well as introduction to metaphysics and other places. And he, he, he comes back to this theme over and over again. What, he, what Heidegger calls Dasein, or the being who's here, what, what is in effect man, what uh, Kunderos is simply calling man here, is man by virtue of the fact that, that, that he or she asks questions, is, is, a, is a being who questions. This is part of our very essence. And so the novelist is, is also like the Heideggerian thinker, someone who is interested in exploring questions of being and who asks questions about being, but is very reticent when it comes to the case of asserting theses about being. Now here in the case of the unbearable lightness of being, which we're going to explore in, in the next lecture, uh, the whole novel, Unbearable Lightness of Being, is nothing but one long interrogation uh, or question, we could say, uh, Kundera says, meditative interrogation or meditative questioning, uh, interrogative meditation uh, is the basis of on which all my novels are constructed. Okay, so uh, a, a med let's say let's say a thinking questioning is another way of saying this. A a a questioning that is thoughtful is the basis on which all my novels are constructed. Which which by its very nature implies the 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 a very explicit rejection of this Marxian notion that a novel should have a particular kind of political. Praxis. Okay, now I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing the Marxian dimensions of this because, you know, Kundera was, was uh, you know, responding to his own situation, which was, uh, you know, growing up and, and, and being, spending a lot of his young adult years in a, in a world that was, um, you know, completely saturated with Marxist uh, dogma or doctrine. But th this, this, same, uh, this same notion is, is certainly relevant. In other contexts as well, if we think of, for instance, you know, I, I mentioned, I gave you the example of, let's say, a, a Christian novel, a, a novel that would be a Christian novel that seeks to convert um, would be for Kundera every bit as immoral as a uh, as the Marxist novel, which seeks to convert. And it certainly would be um, if, if immoral seems kind of uh, strong. I think Kundera is urging us to think of it as immoral. But but for him, the basis of its immorality is its um, is the violence that it does to the novel itself, which is not what novels are for and about for him. What they're 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 rather about asking questions about our existence as 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 humans. Uh, outside the novel, Kundera says, we're in the realm of affirmation. Everyone is sure of his statements. The politician, the philosopher, the concierge. Within the universe of the novel, however. No one affirms. It is the realm of play and of hypothesis. In the novel, then, reflection is essentially inquiring hypothetical. Okay, we could say it's it's uh, it's 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 not Cartesian. Uh, it's not thetic. There's no thesis asserted. There is rather a, a a reflective questioning that takes place. And because this is so, this is why we have to be very careful when we read Kundera's novel, not to just sort of convert them into, uh, in, into some kind of, you know, political program or ideology, which, which would do really excessive violence to his, uh, his novels. Uh, so let's continue. He says, man desires a world where good and evil can be clearly distinguished, for he has an innate and irrepressible desire to judge before he understands. Religions and ideologies are founded on this desire. They can cope with the novel only by translating its language of relativity and ambiguity into their own apopodictic and dogmatic discourse. They require that someone be right. Either Anna Karenina is the victim of a narrow-minded tyrant in, the, in Tolstoy's novel Anna Karenina, or Karenin, her husband, whom she turns into a cuckold, 
is the victim of an immoral woman. Either K in the uh, in the Kafka's novels, uh, Joseph K is an or in the, the case of the trial uh, is an innocent man crushed by an unjust just court, or the court represents divine justice and K is guilty. This either or encapsulates an inability to look to uh, to tolerate the essential relativity of things human, an inability to look squarely at the absence of the supreme judge. This inability makes the novel's wisdom, the wisdom of uncertainty, hard to accept and understand. Okay, he says, and uh, let's continue. He says, the novel spirit is the spirit of complexity. Every novel says to the reader, things are not as simple as you think. That is the novel's eternal truth, but it grows steadily harder to hear amid the din of easy, quick answers that come faster than the question and block it off. In the spirit of our time, it's either Anna or Corinne who is right, and this either or logic, and, and, the, and the ancient wisdom of Cervantes telling us about the difficulty of knowing and the elusiveness of truth seems cumbersome and useless to us. Uh, also, perhaps irritating. You know, irony often can can make uh, uh, us furious if if we find ourselves to be befuddled by it. Okay, he says a novel that is a novel. He says here's his definition: a novel that is a realm where moral judgment is suspended. Suspending moral judgment is not the immorality of the novel; it is its morality. The morality that stands against the ineradicable human habit of judging instantly, ceaselessly in every one, of judging before and in the absence of understanding. From the viewpoint of the novel's wisdom, that fervid readiness to judge is the most detestable stupidity, the most pernicious evil. Not that the novelist utterly denies that moral judgment is legitimate, but simply that he refuses it in the pl in a place a place in the novel. Okay, so that's that's an important distinction. So, a novel a novelist is not a Kundera saying someone who doesn't believe that there's no place for making moral judgments, but he's saying that that's not what the novel is for. Uh, it's never been what the novel is for. All right. Well, uh, as I said, irony can uh, can infuriate uh, infuriate, and he he introduces this this idea. It's kind of a funny idea. Uh, in this talk, in this speech that he gave when he accepted an award in Jerusalem a number of years back, uh, what he calls the agilest, and this is a term from Rabelais. Now, an agilest is uh, is is someone who doesn't know how to laugh. And in uh, in Rabelais, in, in his case, he was certainly uh, uh, hounded by the agilest all of his life. Because uh, think of agilest. He wrote he wrote uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel. And I'll give you one you know example of this. Is he um, you know he 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 likes to talk about this idea uh, uh, one of his themes is that these are these two characters are giants uh, there is there are these passages in the Old Testament where these these uh, giants are, are were were reputed to have been alive uh, at the time of, of Noah and the ark there, there are of course apocryphal stories about the giant you know Wad riding on uh, on Noah's ark riding out the flood and I think that's in the uh, uh, in the Talmud. Uh, there, there also are uh, like in, in the case of, of, of Paul, the apostle Paul's going to, when he says women should wear veils over their head, lest they tempt the angels. Well, there, there are these passages that are in the uh, biblical text that uh, Rabelais, you know, kind of pulls out and, and uh, uh, you know, writes funny stories about, you know, these giants and uh, uh, the church didn't think it was very funny. The church uh, laughed at his uh, blasphemy. Uh, and, and uh, you know, Kundera, after we read Kundera in the same series, the final novel that we're going to look at is Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses. And uh, the, the fate of Rushdie was not unlike the fate of, uh, of Rabelais because he dared to write an ironic novel about uh, the founding of, of Islam. And this, this uh, he, 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 was, he faced many... Uh, death threats for writing this, and there were people, you know, his publishers, translators, you know, killed, and so on, because uh, because the religious authorities in the uh, in the Islamic context didn't find his irony to be funny. So um, we're going to return to this question when we look at Rushdie's The Satanic Verses, 
and we'll look at some of Kundera's comments on, on the satanic verses because I think Kundera deeply appreciated Rushdie's novel and he, he wrote about it in, in uh, Testaments Betrayed. Saul and Rushdie are kind of a fellow traveler or a kindred spirit. Um, but but this is this is precisely what he's talking about. And he wrote these comments, you know, before uh, about you know the Agilas, you know, before uh, if I'm not mistaken, before the whole Rushti controversy, uh, you know, developed. And, and it's certainly true that the that the, the, the Agilas don't like novels that are ironic, and they don't like novels that that are that are comic and that make fun of things that they regard to be you know not uh, uh, appropriate for uh, a literary theme. Okay, so here's here's uh, here's what uh, uh, Kundera says. He says, uh, "Which is right and which is wrong?" Is Emma Bovary in in uh, Flaubert's novel Madame Bovary uh, intolerable, or is you know she brave and touching? Uh, the more attentively we read a novel, the more impossible the answer to a question like that, uh, because the novel is by definition the ironic art. You know, irony is saying one thing, meaning another. Its truth is concealed, undeclared undeclarable. Irony irritates, not because it mocks or attacks, but because it denies us our certainties by unmasking the world as ambiguity. All right, that's a really crucial point there. It, 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 uh, it irritates because it denies us our uh, certainties. We want uh, to be certain in the way that Mr. Descartes is certain uh, in the way that uh, you know all of those who claim that they're uh, standing in a position of competence and correct perception. Let's say, in the case of understanding literature, claim. But uh, but but irony is is going to go after our certainties, and that's what's going to make us uncomfortable because suddenly things don't seem as clear as they did before we read the novel. Okay, no peace is possible. Kundera says between the novelist and the agilas. One or one who does not laugh, one who has no sense of humor. Never having heard God's laughter, the agilists are convinced that the truth is obvious, that all men necessarily think the same thing, and that they themselves are exactly what they think they are. But it is precisely in losing the certainty of truth and the unanimous agreement of others that man becomes an individual. The novel is the imaginary paradise of individuals. It is the territory where no one possesses the truth, neither Anna nor Karen, nor Karen, but where everyone has the right to be understood, both Anna and Karen. Um, okay. Uh, I, okay. Now, uh, I'm going to, what I want to do now is uh, we're, we're coming to the end of our lecture, but I do want to read just a, a, a couple of, I want to make, well, there's two other things that we need to talk about. One is I want to show you a brief passage from, um, uh, from, from, uh, Kundera's Testaments Betrayed, where he speaks about how, you know, novels come to be composed. And he, he makes, you know, he, he, he's also a reader of, of Nietzsche and he likes, and he talks there about, for instance, the aphorism in Nietzsche and how the, uh, how novelistic thought is akin to aphoristic thought in, in Nietzsche. Now, now the, the importance of this in relation to what we've discussed previously is that this notion um, you know, uh, uh, turns back any attempt to systematize or dogmatize what uh, the what uh, is contained in the novel, because the novel, again, remember within the novel and the way that Kundera is articulating it, philosophy is is subsumed within the novel. Uh, the novel it, it does not become uh, subsumed by uh, philosophy, and so the the kind of thinking that that Nietzsche appreciated was also in a similar way very anti. Uh, systematic, very anti-dogmatism. Uh, and so let's let's say, let, let's uh, read what he has to say. He says, authentically novelistic thought, the, 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 the true novels that he's uh, applauding, uh, as the novel has known since, say, Rabelais, is always unsystematic, undisciplined. It is similar to Nietzsche's. It is experimental. It forces rifts in all the idea systems that surround us. A person who thinks is automatically prompted to systematize, to create, you know, doctrines, dogmas. It is his eternal temptation. Mine too, he says, uh, a temptation to describe all the implications of his ideas, to preempt any objections and refute them all in advance, thus to barricade his ideas. Now, a person who thinks should not try to persuade others of his belief. Okay, again, this is anti-conversionary, uh, what, what we're calling is anti-lyrical a view that Kundera is articulating here. 
that is that is what puts them on the road to a system. Anything that puts you on a road to a system, on the lamentable road of the man of conviction. Politicians like to call themselves that. But what is a conviction? It is a thought uh, that has come to a stop, that has congealed. Experimental thought seeks not to persuade, but to inspire, to inspire another thought, to set thought moving. Okay, I, I like that a lot. I think that's a very revealing passage. And I think Kundera at his best certainly is able to achieve this kind of experimental thinking that he's applauding here. All right, now, uh, finally, um, I, I want to just say a, a couple of final words about uh, what Breton, what, what Kundera has to say about uh, Andre Breton. Um, and um, uh, so uh, let me uh, pull this up just one second here. Um, okay, uh, hold on just one second here. Okay, sorry. So I had a little technical uh, glitch there. Um, so what, what I wanted to say here, and again, we're, we're coming to the, the conclusion of this lecture, is that um, um, Andre Bertrand in his Manifesto of Surrealism, really important uh, essay. If you've not read that, you need to read that. But uh, Kundera engages that essay in Testaments Betrayed. He makes a few interesting points about it. And so what, one of the things that, that Bertrand does uh, and if you've read this essay, you'll be uh, familiar with this, uh, the Manifesto of Surrealism, that is, is that he he targets Dostoevsky as a writer of the kind of realism that he uh, loathes. And so in this sense, uh, Kundera it would seem to be sort of on the same page with Andre Breton insofar as they're both, you know, moving away from this idea of a kind of a a dogmatic, you know, realism, but, but, but their difference are very, you know, their, their reasons are very different. Um, now it's, it's strange that Breton, in my view, would pick uh, Dostoevsky as providing this example of, of, of a kind of a, a staid, uh, uninteresting realism, um, because some of Dostoevsky's writings are quite, you know, experimental. Like if we take, for instance, um, uh, uh, the underground man, uh, notes from underground, uh, it, it has characteristics that are uh, of the modern novel and and also characteristics of, of literary realism. But in any case, he cho he chooses Dostoevsky and he focuses on this passage in Dostoevsky, which he considers to be particularly uninteresting. And so Kundera is going to think about uh, Breton's criticism of Dostoevsky. And he's going to he's going to like some aspects of it and he's going to criticize other aspects of it. But let, let, let's see what he let's see what he says here. As we look at this, he says, um, uh, for Andre Breton in his manifesto of surrealism, the novel is an inferior genre. Its style is one of information, pure and simple. The nature of the information given is needlessly specific. Breton says, I am, I am spared not a single one of the hesitations over a character. Shall he be blonde? What should he be called? And the descriptions, there's nothing like the vacuity or the emptiness of these passages. They are just piles of stock images. As an example, uh, there follows then a, pass, a, a, a paragraph quoted from Crime and Punishment, a description of uh, Raskolnikov's room with this comment. Okay, and so uh, here's, what, uh, here's what Kundera is going to say. Some will argue that this academic drawing is appropriate here. Oh, excuse me, this is, this is Breton commenting on uh, Dostoevsky's, uh, what he considers to be vapid, uh, realistic description. So some will think that it belongs here, that it's appropriate, that at this point in the novel, the author has his reasons for loading me down with this description. And then Kundera says, and then this is Kundera's language, but Breton considers these reasons unpersuasive because he says, I don't register the null or empty moments of my life. All right. Uh, then the uh, psychology, the lengthy exposition that tells us everything in advance. Here's Breton again. This hero whose actions and reactions are ad admirably anticipated must not foil, though seemingly likely to foil, the calculations of which he is the object, unquote. And now here's Kundera's comment, which I think is very thoughtful. He says, however partisan this critique of, of Breton's, and it was Breton is kind of can be sort of irritatingly partisan. That's what he's referring to. Uh, he was very dogmatic in his own right. 
Uh, we cannot ignore it, Kundera says, because it does accurately express modern art's reservations towards the novel. Uh, and here he's going to recapitulate what these are. Uh, Breton's uh, reservations, which he says are emblematic of the res uh, reservations of, of uh, you know, modern art in general. The novel has data, description, pointless attention to the null moments of existence, a psychology that makes the character's every move predictable. In short, to roll all the complaints into one, it is the fatal lack of poetry that makes the novel an inferior genre for Breton. I am speaking of poetry as vaunted by the surrealists and the whole of modern art, poetry not as a literary genre as we often think of it, versified writing, but as a certain concept of beauty as an explosion of the marvelous, a sublime moment of life, concentrated emotion, freshness of vision, fascinating surprise. For Breton, the novel is non-poetry par excellence. But, but the question that uh, Kundera asks, which I think is worth asking, is, is Breton criticizing you know, the very essence of the novel or is he attacking its weaknesses? Now, clearly for Kundera, uh, uh, he's, he's criticizing the, you know, the weaknesses of some novels that have been written. But in its essence, the novel has certainly for Kundera has this sort of Flaubertian potential or possibility to be, again, poetry in, into prose. And so let's, let's read this again. What he's saying, uh, a, a concept, a certain poetry is for Kundera then, and remember his novel is poetry into prose, is a certain concept of beauty, an explosion of the marvelous, a sublime moment of life, concentrated emotion, freshness of vision, fascinating uh, surprise. And so what, what Kundera is, is aiming for then is, is to produce precisely this, a kind of a, a, an explosion of the marvelous in his novels. Now, now consequently, again, as I said, his novels take on a certain density. There's, uh, they have a, a quality of ellipsis, which he also uh, uh, advocates. He's, he says, you know, essentially, He's not really a big fan of novels that are, that are too long. A novel should be, you know, short, and it should have a, a great deal of, of, of integrity. And so he, he uh, you know, he, he's affirming uh, much of what Breton says here, but without, you know, going, without, you know, being a, a surrealist. Okay. So, okay. So this, this brings us to a, a conclusion of this particular lecture. Now, what we've tried to do here is just get a, an overview of you know of Kundera's views about the novel and and, and the function of, and the role of the novelist. Again, he's not presenting any kind of doctrine or dogma here. He's he's giving the working conjectures of uh, of a of a novelist who's who's thinking about his craft. And so, in in the next lecture, um, we're going to look at at these some of these ideas and how they play out in terms of the, of the genre itself. You know, of the narrative of um, the unbearable lightness of being, and then in the lecture after that, we're going to just we're going to just choose one theme that we're going to follow through, which uh, conjoins with the other themes that we followed in this in, in this uh, series of lectures on animal metamorphosis, and we're going to see how this theme is operative in in the novel uh, at, at, as well.